Hey everybody, I'm Jesse Showalter and I'm the Huddle Campus Pastor and we here at The Fellowship are all about reaching people for Christ and helping believers to grow to be more like Him. Here's some ways that you can be a part right now. Consider sharing this link online, social media, or texting it to a friend and having them join you in the celebration. We exist to reach people for Christ and help believers grow to be like Him. We desire for you to be a part of that mission and here are the four ways that you can be a part. If you want to connect, maybe you are a first time believer and you have questions, maybe you have prayer requests, want to join a life group or want to get connected with one of our pastors, you can text CONNECT to the number at the bottom of your screen. Here at The Fellowship, we prioritize community. If you have a need or you want to be a part of helping to fill needs in this body, then follow the directions at the bottom of the screen. Here at The Fellowship, your generosity moves the gospel forward. To give, text GIVE to the number at the bottom of your screen. We are a people rooted and grounded in prayer, and we are petitioning God for big movement in this time. If you want to get involved in prayer, then follow the directions at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much for getting connected with us here at The Fellowship. Hey church, my name is David Hansen. I'm a student pastor here at The Fellowship. We will begin our service shortly, but I wanna let you know about a few opportunities for you, your kids, and your students. Our kids ministry has resources, Bible stories, and devotionals that your kids can do in the comfort of your own home. To get those, simply visit our website or follow the link on the screen. Likewise, our student ministry has many opportunities for students to connect throughout the week. On Wednesdays at 2 p.m., we will have Immerse Live, where students can come, hang out, and chat online. In addition to that, we will have devotionals and Bible stories going out through our social media platforms. If you don't want to miss any of this, make sure that you text the appropriate code to 512-572-3555. You will see those codes on the screen. Other than that, you can visit our website for any further information. Adults, we didn't forget about you. There are multiple ways that you can jump in and be a part. Simply visit our website to find opportunities for prayer, devotionals, and specifically care ministry. Jump in, visit the website, be a part. Good morning, church, and happy Easter. We are so glad that you are here to join us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. As you know, this year's Easter looks a little bit different than years past, but here we are still glorifying and praising God across our cities. This is going to be an Easter we will never forget. On Friday, we remembered what Jesus accomplished in his death on the cross. Today, we celebrate his resurrection, his victory over sin and death. This is a morning to celebrate. This is a morning to lift high the name of Jesus in your household. So parents, we ask you to do this. At the conclusion of this service, we are going to begin a children's Easter program that is specifically designed for your kids to get to celebrate the resurrection of the Savior. So keep your kids in their seats because it's going to be really special and really fun. This is the time to get your family together, grab your coffee, your Bibles, get your pens handy, grab your phone and text that friend that you've been meaning to invite to Easter service because we are about to get started. Join me as I open us in prayer. God, we love you so much, and we are so thankful for this morning that we have to get to celebrate Easter in a little bit different of a way than we usually do. God, we thank you for our homes and for our families that you have given us to celebrate with you today. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, for his sacrifice that was made for us so that we could have life. And so this morning, God, we give the entire morning to you. We give it to you to celebrate you, to praise you for who you are and what you have done. God, bless this morning. Do a new work in our hearts. It's in your name. Amen.
the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me church we're declaring we believe that truth today that jesus is risen he's alive he's our living eternal hope let's sing all honor and power and glory are his forever and let's give him the praise he deserves come on let's sing see the tomb where he lay see the stone
again you took And you took all our shame You left it in the grave And we're forgiven Oh, we're forgiven The work is done The work forever done Hold it by the blood It is finished Oh, it is finished You let it see the leaves And all Be magnified 
Easter Church. My name is Brandon Weir. I'm one of the pastors here at the fellowship, and we're so glad that we get to celebrate this Resurrection Sunday with you. Now, this is the day where we celebrate Jesus, who is God himself, coming to this earth, living a perfect life, being obedient to God in every single way for 33 years. He went and did miracles. He did some amazing things while he was here. He taught some things that still ring true in our heart today, and he would go to the cross after 33 years here on this earth And three days later, he would rise and he's risen. He's seated at the right hand of the Father now. And we know that and we believe that and we trust in that. So today we celebrate that. And if you've never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can do that today by declaring to him, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And if you do that, we would love to connect with you. If you could just text CONNECT, pretty simple, pretty easy, CONNECT to the number that's here at the bottom. We we wanna help you, walk with you through that, help disciple you, show you what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus. If you're a person that has a need, you have a physical need right now, or you're someone who wants to help out and you wanna help somebody else that's in need, you can text need to the number that you'll see at the bottom. Or if you're a person that has a prayer request, something that's going on, please text prayer to the number that you'll see at the bottom. See, it's pretty simple, pretty easy. We're trying to find easy ways to connect with you during this time. It's really important to us for that. Now, also during this time, we celebrate a God who has given us more than you and I could ever know. And and it is our goal, our responsibility, our calling from God to go out and to spread his name, to give the good news to the world around us. And so the truth is, is that your giving helps do that. And God has called us to be obedient in giving. And so if you would like to give right now, you can do that by texting give to the number that you'll see at the bottom or by checking out our website, clicking on the banner that's right there and doing that. 
We're so glad that you decided to join with us this morning. We hope that God, opening God's word will bless your heart and that you will have an opportunity just to see a God that loves you very much and who desires to know you. Happy Easter and welcome to the fellowship. I am so glad wherever you're situated in the world that you have decided to worship and join us this glorious morning. Okay, as is tradition, as is tradition, I'm going to say he is risen and right there in your living room, kitchen, wherever you're gathered, you're gonna respond with the appropriate response, which is he has risen indeed. And so here we go. We're gonna do one practice and then we'll do it for real. So here's the practice one. He is risen and now you say, he is risen indeed. This one's for real. He is risen. All right. I, now, anybody that was quiet, there's going to be punishment for that. All right. Just know that. This is supposed to be group participation here. This is an insane, crazy. I wake up every day and I'm not sure I believe what I actually see. Um, it doesn't help that like everybody's sort of stuck at home and they're getting all these creative ideas. Uh, this quarantine, I think it really is dry, making us mad, but um, every day I feel like my wife has a new social media challenge. Like, have you guys seen this? Have you seen the challenge where, where you're supposed to put a book on your foot, you put a book on your foot, and then, and then you roll over, so you lay down on your back, balance a book, and then you're supposed to keep that book balanced on your foot as you roll over? Well, just for the record, I blew my hip out watching her do it. All right, so she should, honestly, she should be in the circus. I mean, it was crazy. And then, and then here, another one she had, so you take a piece of paper, a lot of you guys have done this, I know you have, but you take a piece of paper, you fold it in half, and then you're supposed to bend over and pick the paper up off the floor with your mouth. Now, you can't use your hands, you can't balance yourself with your hands, and so you do it in different poses, and then you're supposed to go to one foot. And so she's going through all of these things, and she makes it look so easy, so she says, hey, you try. And now, I love my wife, and we've been married for a long time, but I, I have a little bit of a germ thing. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but um, I don't pick up paper off the floor with my hands, let alone with my mouth. You know, there's a five second rule, like people drop stuff, it's five seconds. There is no five second rule. Once it hits the ground, disqualified, all right? You can no longer touch or eat what hits the floor. And so I see the madness and I don't believe most of what I see. Well, here this Easter morning. We are going to spend the next several minutes in the scriptures. We're going to be in the book of John. John is a fascinating perspective for us to take the resurrection story because John wrote the entire gospel for one purpose, and it is that we would hear and we would believe. Now, John sets up this his gospel with seven miracles. So he makes these seven miracles and then he puts the cherry on top, which is the story of the resurrection. And this is um, fascinating stuff because when John actually put this gospel together, when the gospel was put together, some people say middle of the first century. Some people say it was at the end of the first century. I personally believe it was in Ephesus, which is Western Turkey around 85 AD. But it was, the point is this, it was a timestamp. And so John was looking back as an old man giving insight on what he saw so that you and I would believe. And he did it by giving us seven miracles and then the resurrection story. Now, the resurrection story, he actually sets up in a form and he takes us from the cross to the resurrected Christ and he does it by putting together a list of the things he has seen. That's what we're gonna study this morning and I believe it's going to help us properly celebrate the resurrected Christ. Let me pray over us this morning and then let's get into God's word. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for this incredible day. This is the foundation of our entire faith. Without this, Lord, we would be hopeless. And so God, I thank you so much that you gave us this point, this moment in history that we would be able to lean on all the way back in the first church, the first century church, when they didn't have the Bible, all they had was the resurrection and the hope of it. And so, Lord, today, I pray that that same hope would just stir our souls. So now, today, in the next few moments, would you teach our hearts? Would you inspire our hearts? And then, Lord, would you capture our hearts this Easter Sunday morning? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. I got so excited, I almost knocked over my podium. All right, here we go. We're going to pick up the story, okay? The resurrection story. We're going to pick it up with Jesus on the cross. The seven miracles that John lists have already been put together. Now we're looking at the list of what he saw 
And the goal of the entire gospel is for us to believe. He writes all this so that we might believe. And so here goes the list. Starting in John chapter 19, starting in verse 25, it says, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas and, and Mary Magdalene. Watch this. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple who he loved standing nearby, just push pause, time out, time out. I, I wanna point out two things. First of all, remember, John has watched Jesus' entire ministry. He has seen it all. He's listed the miracles. And now he is standing, a bystander, looking up at the cross, Calvary's cross with Jesus hanging on the cross. And he's detailing the list of things he saw. And one of the things that he saw in this moment that he is about to list is just the simplicity of, I saw Jesus on the cross. Now, I, I wanna make sure I clarify something because it says here in verse 26, it says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, this is John. The disciple whom he loved is John. Kind of an interesting fact. Maybe it's not that interesting, but the name John is never used in the gospel of John. It's never used. In fact, there's not even a list of the 12 disciples in the gospel of John. And so John's name is, is never used. And so in this, he's gonna to refer to himself as the other disciple or the disciple or the one whom Jesus loved. That's how John identifies himself as he is an old man looking back, telling the story that he wants us to hear so that we might believe. Let me keep reading here. He goes on, okay, well, hold on, before I, before I keep going, I just play trivia in my head. And so um, the name John is used in the book of John. I, I, it's used early on, John the Baptist is listed. And then Peter, is, his real name is Simon. And Jesus calls him at the end of John, calls him Simon, son of John. So we see the name John from John the Baptist and then Peter's dad's name, John. So we see those two Peter, John's used, but we don't see the other, I don't know. I just played trivia in my head. I don't know, that's, that's where we're at. Okay, let's keep going. John, the disciple's not listed. He goes on, verse 27, he says this. Then he said to the disciple, behold, your mother. He had looked down, Jesus looked down, he saw John, he said, John, this is your mom. And now he says to, he's just basically pairing them up saying, I want you to take care of my mom. Mommy's gonna take care of you. And he says to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. This means that John, the beloved disciple, took Mary and began to tend to her and care for her as if she was his very own mom. John, up there in age, is looking back and he begins the list of what he saw with Jesus on the cross by saying, I saw Jesus on the cross. Now, I'm gonna push us forward just a little bit here, go to verse 28, because in verse 28, because this list of, the list of things that we, we, he sees, here we go. Verse 28, it says, after this, Jesus knowing that all was now finished, said, this is to fulfill the scriptures. It says, I thirst. And then in verse 29, a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they, being the soldiers, they put a sponge full of this sour wine on this hyssop branch and they held it to Jesus's mouth, almost as if they were mocking him. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, and he breathed this out, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. John saw Jesus on the cross. He's making the list. And John saw Jesus draw his very last breath. Now, this is important for us to get. This idea that John is actually putting together this idea of a list so we can know what he saw. Why? We're gonna get there, but so that we might believe. This is, this is probably a little um, bad timing, but I'm still gonna share this because I've got a list of things that I've seen over the past couple of weeks that are kind of crazy. Like this is, my son and I were driving home uh, one evening and, and I saw with my eyes, I saw a, a woman walking a bird on a leash. Now I have a witness because my son was there, a bird on a leash walking down the road. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. We saw a, a, a baby was in one of those little wagons behind a bike. And as they were going along, the, the helmet had fallen over the baby's face. And so the helmet just bounced around the baby's face and he's right in the wagon. I mean, it was just, it's, it's just funny stuff. And then probably the craziest thing, crazier than the bird. I saw a lady walking a two-legged dog, a two-legged dog. Now, 
I know you're thinking, you humans, all high and mighty sitting there listening to this, you're thinking, what's the big deal? I walk on two legs every day. In the dog world, walking on two legs, that's some impressive stuff. All right. And so this list, so I, I could come up with this long list of things. I see, I saw it at an intersection right here, right in my neighborhood, 21 people standing there waiting to cross the road. 21 people. We're supposed to be staying home. 21 people standing on one corner. And so I look and I can think about all the things that I see. John, looking back on his life, is saying, let me give you a list of the things that I've seen. I saw Jesus on the cross. I saw Jesus draw his last breath. And then he keeps going. He's going to push us forward a little bit further. John chapter 19, I'm going to pick up in verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the crosses for the Sabbath, because the Sabbath was, was upon them, the Jews asked Pilate, that their legs might be broken, that they may be taken away. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first guy. There were three guys. There was Jesus hanging in the middle. There were two other people hanging on each side on crosses that had been crucified. And they break the first one's legs. And then they go to the other one. Same thing, to break his legs. And then they came to Jesus in verse 33. When they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead and they did not break his legs. But, hear me clearly, One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came blood and water gushing out to the foot of the cross. And he who saw it, John is saying, I saw this. I'm bearing witness to this. Just like my son could say, I saw the two-legged dog. I saw the lady walking the bird. He's saying, I am a witness to what I've seen. And what I saw, this testimony, it is true. It's true. I saw Jesus on the cross. I saw him breathe his last last breath. And he's saying here, I saw them stick a spear into his side and blood and water come gushing out. Verse 35, he says, I bore witness to this, this testimony. This is truth. John's saying, you got to believe what I'm telling you. It's everlasting change will take place for your soul if you do. He says, telling the truth. And the reason I'm telling you this, look at the end of verse 35. I'm telling you this because I want you to believe I need, you've got to believe this. It's eternally changing. He keeps going. He's going to go down to verse 38. And in verse 38, they take Jesus' body down off the cross. And if they, after they took his body down off the cross, they actually then moved. And, and what are they going to do with this? Well, they took Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. You guys know this portion of the story, but let me keep going. I'm going to read through it here. After these things took place, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly... So he didn't tell people secretly because he feared the Jews. He asked Pilate that he might take the body of Jesus and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took the body away. Now Nicodemus, who has also had come to Jesus earlier by night because he didn't want people to know, came bringing a mixture of myrrhs and aloes and 75 pounds in weight. So it brought a ton of this. This was how they were going to embalm the body. They were going to prepare the body for burial. So they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in linen and the cloths and the spices as it is custom for the burial for Jews. They're following the law. In verse 41, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in this garden, there was a new tomb which belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, which no one had ever been laid in. And then it says in verse 42, so because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they decided to lay him there. In other words, they were in a big hurry. John though has just added to his list. Not only did he see him on the cross, not only did he actually watch him take his last breath, not only did he see a spear stick into his side and blood and water pour out to the foot of the cross, I saw the tomb. I saw them seal the tomb. I saw them prepare his body. John is just making a detailed list, looking back on what he had seen and what he had experienced so that you might believe. John chapter 20. I'm going to push this forward one more step. And in John chapter 20, John begins to tell this story. And and this is a great story. You got to hear it from, I think about my father-in-law telling this story you may think about maybe one of your parents or someone that you know who is a pretty good storyteller, but they're known to maybe, you know, push the limits in their storytelling. And so to make sure that their point is really made, listen, listen how John tells the story, okay? So, so he goes in verse one, let me, let me do this. It says, now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and she saw that the stone had been taken away. So what John had seen, placed in the tomb, this tomb sealed, 
Mary comes and she sees this tomb is rolled away. Panic. She doesn't know what to do. She ran and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciples the, to the one whom Jesus loved, which is John, not named, but it's John, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, which is John, and they were going towards the tomb. Watch this. Here we go. This is, this is, the, this is the old man telling the story. Both of them were running, but the other disciple, he's talking about himself. Yeah, he outran Peter. This is, like, this is like John saying, hey, I just want you to know back in my day, I had some wheels, all right? I outran him like I'd left him in my dust. And so he's telling this though, and it's so great. He says, and he reached the tomb first. And in the next verse, verse five, and after stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloth laying there, but he did not go in. So John said, I did not go in. I didn't go in. I got there first, but I didn't go in. Verse six, then Simon Peter came following him. He got here second, remember? Boom, flex on him, outran him. And then he did go into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth that Jesus' head would have been in. Not, and it was laying there and it was folded up all by itself. Like it didn't look like it was taken in a hurry. It wasn't a rush. It was like, like what exactly has taken place? And then John says, the other disciple, which is me, I, the one who got there first, he says this again, who reached the tomb first, then I decided to go in. And look what happened when he went in. Look, look. I saw and I believed. There were no heroes of faith in this story. As Jesus hung on the cross, it wasn't a group of people going, yeah, we stand firm in our faith. We're not gonna live in fear. We trust in Jesus. We trust in him. There was no heroes in faith. Even John, the one that Jesus loved, he loved Jesus, wasn't a hero of faith. He didn't. He lived in doubt, watching Jesus on the cross, seeing everything that takes place. But once he walked in, he saw that he was gone and then he believed. There was a moment for John and that's why John has spent an entire lifetime trying to figure out how to tell people what he saw so that they would believe because he knew when I saw it, then I believed. John 20, we pick up in verse 26. By the way, if you're taking a list, John saw an empty tomb. One more thing he saw for his list. He's gonna keep pushing us forward though. And as he pushes us forward in John chapter 20, I'm gonna to go to verse 26. It says, eight days later. So this is eight days after all of these events took place. His disciples, the disciples were all together, gathered together and Thomas was there with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. The reason Jesus said, peace be with you is because he scared them. Like he just scared the life out of them. It's, I don't know if they were rationing toilet paper then like we are now, but I imagine that that was a moment for them. And so Jesus says, no, 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 don't, peace, peace be with you. Just sort of calming them down because fear had struck them. And then he said to Thomas, hey, Thomas, come here. In verse 27, I want you to put your fingers here. See my hands? Put out your hand. And he placed it, took his hand and he placed it then on his side. And he just simply said to Thomas, don't disbelieve, believe. Now, I'm going to tell you this because a lot of people would push back and, and they would push on the idea of the resurrection. Let me tell you the miraculous thing of the resurrection, the restoration of Jesus's body. Now, you and I both know that having a, a nail driven through your feet, nails driven through your hand, a spear driven through your side, and then eight days later, you are walking just randomly walking around, just traveling miles upon miles upon miles. I look at this and say, I believe that the resurrected body, the restored body of Jesus was the greatest sign that the disciples could have possibly seen. Now it would have been awesome to see him limping around, but this is a restored body. And Thomas then answered, my Lord, my God, without question, he now knows he has seen and he has believed. And Jesus said to him, you have believed because you have seen me. Now, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you. That's me. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who believe, even if they haven't seen. Well, John, being an eyewitness, he saw these things. He's passed them on to me and you so that we, even without seeing, we would believe. We would believe. Verse 30, now Jesus he did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe 
Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so this brings me to really this one pivotal moment, and it is, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe? Acts 16, 31, it says that when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. We know Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But the question comes down to this, and it's a really fair question for me to propose to you right now. It's, do you believe? Do you believe? I'm going to spend a moment here because I... uh, I'm going to be rude for a minute, all right? I know it's Easter and we're happy and this is a glorious day, but I'm, I'm going to be rude for a minute. So let, let me get there first. Let me, let me build up and then let me, let me get there. So here's how I build up to get us there. I would build up to get us there by simply saying, um, we live in a world where I hear this often. Well, I would love to believe, but how am I supposed to believe in a God when look around the world, look at the, even this virus? How am I supposed to believe when I see these things? Now, I'm about to get rude. Okay, here we go. What do you expect? If you've studied or read the scriptures, what do you really expect? We are a people, a country, a nation who mock the living God, not just with our words, but with our lives. What, what do we really expect? I, I'm watching the news and I'm not gonna tell you what news channel I was watching. I don't wanna start a war in your living room or with your family members or make you afraid to pass this message on to your family members. But I was watching a certain news channel and there's a guy, he's the mypillow.com guy, Mike Liddell. I'm like, I, I have a MyPillow, by the way. It's the greatest pillow on planet earth. If you don't have one, you need to buy one. And so just, just know mypillow.com, it's incredible. Well, Mike Liddell, he has chosen to shut down his operation, no longer making pillows. He's now producing around 50,000 masks a day. So for for health safety, he's actually having this this conference and he's sharing what he's doing. And he says, he says, it's time for us to turn back as families. You're now gathered with your family. It's time as a family to turn back to the Bible, back to God's word. It's time for us to turn back to God. Now I'm watching a news channel and they are literally mocking him for saying, turn back to God. I would believe, but I look around. What do you expect? Can I tell you that we live in a world that for years, and I know that some of you grew up in churches that were really boring. You had a hard time paying attention. I know some of you didn't grow up in church. And some of you have just recently maybe decided that you were gonna start exploring your faith. Well, there's this thing called the soft gospel. And what that means is we only talk about the really positive things. And the soft gospel has made certain verses in the Bible really famous. Here's one that I wanna just force you to read. I want to force you to read a passage, a verse. Now, before I read the one I want you to read, let me read the one that you've heard. This is the soft gospel. This is the one that it's on t-shirts, coffee mugs. This is the one that you might have this on a banner above your wall. Certainly your church under prayer ministry, it has this. It's 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. (laughs) We know this one. 7, 14, we know it. But what, what about the verse before See, because this one is one that we don't read. This one's one we, we don't want any part of. This is the one that would shake some of us to say, I want to believe, but here we go. Second Chronicles 7, 13, the verse right before it. It says, when I, God speaking, when I, when God, I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain. Or when I, God, command the locusts to devour the land so there's no, there's no crops. Or when I, God, send pestilence, which is disease, viruses, among my people. He says, when I do these things, here's what I'm hoping for. And then verse 14 makes sense. He's like, when I do these things, when I capture the attention of my people, then after I do these things, if my people who are called by name, my name, if they will humble themselves and they will pray and they will seek my face and they will turn from their wicked ways, If they do this, I will hear from them. And listen carefully. 
I will heal their land. I really do believe that we are living in a moment in time in history where John's message, his gospel, has never been more relevant. Saying, I've seen all of these things. I need you to know what I've seen so that you might believe. Because if by us hearing what John says, in we believe this. If this is, if this is the equation and we turn back to God, God clearly tells us in the word, if you turn to me, I will heal you. I will forgive you. I will bring you peace. And I will bring you hope. And I will bring you life. And so I find myself in this passage looking at an older John, aged. As he's looking back and he's telling a story, I see a grandpa telling a story and he's trying to get everybody in the living room to believe this is really how it happened. And as John is telling the story, he doesn't just give seven miracles in the gospel that he's going to hinge the hope on. He then goes into the resurrection. And in the resurrection, he gives us a detailed list of what he saw the day of and the days following the resurrection. And he did all of this, the miracles telling us about them, the list. He did this so that you may believe because he knows that if you, if I, if we will turn back in faith to God, our souls are healed. And if your soul is healed, my soul is healed. The souls around you are healed. We're turning back to God. God's word is so faithful. He is so faithful. He says, I will heal your land. We are a land that needs healing. We are a people that needs forgiveness. We are a people that need to understand that we cannot mock God with our lives and expect anything other than calamity. I want to believe, but these things... What do you expect? The scriptures are clear. And so what I would say is this. Let me flip it. What I would say is this is the gospel, the good news. He was clear with us to say when these things happen, when this happens, when this happens, no matter what happens, he's clear to say, turn to me, come to me, take refuge in me, and I will be your God and you will be my people. Today, that's my question for you is, hey, John's given you a list You've heard the story. You've gathered yourself in the living room. You've taken the time to listen to this. So now, wouldn't you at least take a, a moment to, to ponder, to consider? What about your soul? Not, not the souls around you. What about your soul? What about where you are at with God? Because when it tells us in the scriptures, in Romans 9, 10, 9 and 10, when it says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. Maybe today is the day of salvation for you. Maybe it's the day of salvation. This would be why John put this entire gospel together so that when you heard, you would believe. So back to my question before I got rude. Do you believe? If you are in that moment today where you say, I so desperately want to, you pray this right where you say, you can keep your eyes open. I want you to pray, God, today I need to believe. I'm ready to believe. I am turning back to you. In fact, church of the living God, why don't we pray this together right now? Why don't you pray, God, today I'm turning my attention, my heart, my trust, my faith, my hope back to you. God, John has given me this list. I've seen it. I've heard it. And now I'm hearing it. I believe. And so God, today I'm turning back to you. I want you guys to understand this morning, before I close this prayer, I want you to understand this morning that because the tomb was empty, that means that your heart does not have to be. Your soul does not have to be. Your hope does not have to be. And so today, this is my prayer now over you. Those of you who have just turned to God for the first time, those of you who have chosen to turn back, those of you that have listened to John's words and you have considered, and you say, today, I know it's time for me to believe. This is my prayer for you. God, fill, fill our hearts, fill our souls, fill us with joy, fill us with hope. And God, what I pray above all things is that you would fill us with a list of things that we see in and around us that represent how powerful and loving and caring God you are. Today, I thank you for the souls that have said yes to you for the first time. I thank you for the souls that have chosen today to say, I need to come back. Here we are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.
amen and amen. Happy Easter, church. And you took all our shame and left it in the grave. We're forgiven. We're forgiven. The work forever done only by the blood. It is finished. It is finished. And you took all our shame and left it in the grave. We're forgiven. And we're forgiven. alongside you and celebrate Jesus with you. Here at The Fellowship, we believe in the power of Christ-centered community. And now more than ever, we believe that community is vital to our church congregation. That is why we desire to get you plugged into a fellowship group. If you wanna get plugged into a fellowship group, then text the word CONNECT to the number at the bottom of your screen and we will get you connected this week. Church, we thank you for being a part of what God is doing here at The Fellowship. We will see you back here next week, same time, same place. And parents, remember that your kids' service starts right after this service concludes, so stick around for that. Happy Easter. kids and happy Easter. That's right. Happy Easter. This is such an exciting morning for us. I hope you are having the best morning ever because guess what? We are celebrating the best news ever this morning. We are celebrating that Jesus had risen from the tomb. Now keep in mind, boys and girls, that Jesus had taken our punishment by dying on the cross for our sins and they had laid him in a tomb. But three days later, he rose from the grave and that is what we're celebrating this morning. Now I want you 
to scream your excitement about this. So this is what I'm going to do. I am going to say, He is risen, and I want to hear you say as loud as you can in your home, He is risen indeed. Now, I want you to say it so loudly that your neighbors can hear it. I want you to say it so loudly that I can hear it. Are you ready? All right, let's try this. He is risen. I think I heard you. I'm pretty sure I heard some of you, but you know what? I'm pretty sure we can go louder. Let's try it a little bit louder. Here we go. Ready? He is risen. I, I can hear you. Wow, what a celebration this morning is. Now, boys and girls, I want you to gather around the screen because I want to talk to you for a few minutes this Easter morning. Boys and girls, this has been such an interesting time for us, and there are so many things for us to be thankful for. You have gotten to spend so much time with your families and in your homes and out on walks. I see you walking your dogs and walking with your neighbors. But I think we're all missing our friends a little bit. I know that you're missing your friends from school, and I know that you're also missing your friends on the soccer field or in your classes, dance and gymnastics and all of those things, and we're missing our church friends. I would love it right now if we were all together so I could hug you and tell you Happy Easter and see your beautiful clothes for Easter. But today is different, and you know what? It's okay. And this reminds me of Jesus and a story in the Bible. So we're going to go into our Bibles this morning and we're going to talk about an experience that Jesus had right at Easter. This story takes place in the four Gospels. These are the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's in all four of them. So it's important. Boys and girls, Jesus, I'm going to pull out my finger puppets. Are you ready? Jesus is going to live on my thumb. You ready? There's Jesus. And he had a lot of friends called the disciples. There were actually 12 of them, but Miss Christie only has three with me because first of all, I don't have 12 fingers. And also, I only had three little guys. These guys represent the disciples and this is Jesus. Now here's how this plays out in God's true word. Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years. And the last three years, he spent all of his time with the disciples, his very best friends. What did they do together? They did everything together. They traveled together, they ate together. When Jesus was teaching, they were listening. When Jesus was healing, they were there. They were constantly together and it was such a beautiful time of friendship. Towards the last days of Jesus' life, two really amazing things happened. One thing that happened was they had the Last Supper. Jesus sat down with all of his friends and they had a wonderful meal together. At this meal, Jesus washed each of his disciples' feet. He loved them so much and he wanted them to know that, so he spent the time to wash their feet. And then the disciples traveled to the Garden of Gethsemane and they were going to pray together. Now, really, the disciples fell asleep. They were super, super, super tired. But you know what? Jesus didn't. Jesus stayed wide awake, and he prayed for his friends. They loved each other so much. But then things got a little bit difficult. It was time for Jesus to go to the cross to die for punishment for our sin. So in the garden, Jesus was arrested. This was a very scary thing for the disciples, and Jesus had done nothing wrong. He never even sinned, but it was time for him to go accomplish what he was here for. His disciples were so afraid that they ran. They ran away. And we find Jesus was alone. He was all alone by himself. Well, the next few moments and day were very difficult. Jesus was taken, he was treated terribly, and then they hung his body on the cross to die. Then when he was dead, they took his body down and they put him in a tomb. Well, that wasn't the end of the story. Because three days later, Mary and Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and guess what? He wasn't there. Jesus had risen from the tomb. He was alive. It was such an amazing thing and guess what? One of the first things he did was, he went and found his friends. He went and showed his friends, hey, I'm here, I'm alive, and I love you. Boys and girls, <coughs> sorry. Boys and girls, okay. <coughs> I was holding that as long as I could. What did I say? 
say first that he went with, with his friends. Boys and girls, this was such a lonely time for Jesus, and it had to have been so hard. But in this time that Jesus was alone, he saved the whole world. He saved the whole world in this time. And sometimes when we're alone, big things can happen. Boys and girls, what Jesus did for us was to take the punishment on the cross for our sins. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. And if we will believe that, we also get to live forever with Jesus. What an amazing gift. So this Easter Sunday, that's what we're celebrating. We are celebrating that Jesus was not in that tomb. He had risen, and that was for you, and that was for me. And we have so much to celebrate. Now, parents, when we conclude here, I want you to do this. I want you to click on the kids link and jump over to our website because I want you to see something cool. I know your celebrations for Easter probably look a little different today. You don't get to be with a lot of your friends and you don't probably even get to be with grandma and grandpa. But if you will hop over to our website, you are gonna see Grammy Christina, Miss Amy, and Miss Leslie celebrating Easter on a Zoom call. They're actually gonna have a virtual Easter egg hunt. Absolutely fun, absolutely crazy. So as soon as we close down here, I want you to click that link and go to that video. Parents, there are new resources weekly that you can look at videos, lessons, etc. So please go to these resources. We are so excited for you to engage with your children and the Bible. And big news, in two weeks, April 25th, we are going to launch Children's Church every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Join us for large group. Gather your family in the living room. Tune in because we are going to have Children's Church for you and your families. Fellowship kids, we love you. We miss you. I hope you have the best Easter ever, and we will see you soon.